Welcome to the Black Doctors Talk Podcast. I am Dr. Christopher Holmes, host for this episode and member of the Black Doctoral Network. Today, I am joined by Dr. Melanie Gray, who is a nurse, educator, advocate, and mentor. Welcome, Dr. Gray. Thank you so much, Dr. Holmes. It's such a pleasure to be here. Well, listen, you guys don't know, but we've already had some great conversation before we started airing this episode, so I know this is going to be a great interview. Um, first, I would like to start by letting the viewers know uh, a little bit about your background. So, Dr. Gray, where does it all begin for you? Well, it all began, began for me over 20 years ago. My mother was a nurse. She was an LPN, and uh, she said to me, you need, in those days, you need to find something that you can do. Uh, that's going to allow you to have some financial independence because you you have lived with me you're going to college and don't come back and, and uh, she really you know loved me but um she really wanted me to be independent uh so i wanted to be in a helping profession so i started off actually i laddered i started like, as many people did uh when i started in my career i, I uh, became a, a rn and then I went on and got my master's in nursing education and a PhD in online learning. But I really staffed at the bedside, Dr. Holmes, for over 20 years because I became a nurse to take care of people. But it was when I had met some other, you know, I've been a member of the National Black Nurses for a very long time, active in my local chapter. And people would say, well, Melanie, you need to go back to school. Melanie, you need to go back to school. And I like, but I really do like being at the bedside. And they're like, but you can do some other things. And so they pushed me. They saw something in me that I didn't initially see in myself. And uh, so my career kind of went from there. I've done everything in nursing you could imagine. ICU, cardiac, uh, management, outpatient care, uh, you name it. I have pretty much done uh, a lot, of, done something in it. Uh, 14 years in higher education. So I have kind of a broad level of experience. So now you all can see she's got a lot of years in nursing. Black doesn't crack. Look at that. That's a 35-year-old. That's 35. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so with being in nursing so long, what have you seen change in, in these years you've done this work? Well, certainly the technology has changed. Uh, the accountability for a nurse has changed. When I graduated, they told you, if you follow the doctor's orders, you are pretty much good. But now you as a licensed professional, nurses are held to the standard of knowing what the doctor ordered and if they should do it. So the expectation is that if you are providing the medic, uh, administering the medication, providing the care, you need to know that's what you should be doing. So the accountability for a nurse has really changed. The advancements in science, you have to know so much more. I often say, if I had to start over again, you know, honestly, Dr. Holmes, I don't know that the immensity of the knowledge is really, really great. But I will also say that the needs are greater. Mm -hmm. uh, for people. Uh, we are a very scientifically based uh, society, but we also have some of the uh, most cro more chronic illnesses than many other countries and other parts of the world. So I've seen the uh, advancement in technology, but I've also seen a, a, a huge decline in the health of our community. And it's not just Black people, it's all people, you know, the rise in obesity, hypertension, and there seems to be less uh, personal accountability for the maintenance of one's health. So mm -hmm. those are kind of the things that really seem change. And I know we talked a little bit about this before we started, but talk a little bit more about education and advocacy and why it's so important. Well, uh, from the standpoint of education, um, I think that for people of color particularly, because that's what we, that or all people actually, a degree is really valuable. Education and expanding your mind and your knowledge is important. But often young people think, well, I'm going to college to get a better job, right? You know, they want to learn. But the real outcome also is to be able to build a career. 
And what I have observed is many young people don't leverage college, the opportunities in college to work with professors, to be on work groups, to work on a college-wide government, uh, to seek internships so that they build a resume while they're in college to help them once they graduate. Too often young people just go to college and they get good grades. But when they graduate from college, they don't have a resume that's established to help propel them in the uh, in their in their you know chosen career. And so they're often disappointed, and they say, "Well, I went to college, but I'm, I'm serving coffee, you know, at a coffee shop." Mm-hmm. And it's taking a lot longer than to get the experience and build the social capital. And there are some people, Dr. Holmes, whose families, who their parents are professionals. And their parents, you know, if you grew up in a home with two people that had master's degrees, your perspective of what to do, where to go, how to do it is different than if you are a first generation college. Right student and that's where that social capital and guidance and mentorship on how to leverage education i think is sometimes missing so let's let's dive a little bit deeper uh into the work that you do um as it relates to COVID 19 and now this delta variant yes Um, what impact are you seeing that this is happening having on the black and brown community well i i'm sadly seeing that uh, we are having less access. Well, access initially to the uh, vaccine was not as uh, open to people of color, but now it's, it's available everywhere. The challenge is that I am observing people being so mystified by disinformation and misinformation. And it concerns me because we are dying at a higher rate from COVID. Now, here's the thing, Dr. Holmes. Uh, If you, if someone gets uh, exposed to the COVID virus and now the variant, we do not know exactly how any one individual is going to respond to that virus. You might be, have no symptoms and walk around and infect a hundred people, but you won't know it. One of your best friends might uh, get ex- exposed to the virus and maybe become deathly ill and end up in a hospital. Someone else could be in a hospital on a ventilator. Someone else might die. Someone else might be so greatly impacted that they become a long hauler and are totally disabled and facing financial ruin, uh, physical uh, hardship for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Now, we do know pretty clearly that if you get the, get the vaccine, you're gonna have a sore arm for the first dose pretty much. And you might actually feel you know, kind of fluish, but that is your body's immune system doing what it should do, building antibodies. The second uh, injection, you might feel a little more sore and a little have you know, maybe more uh, flu-like symptoms, but that is not the vi- vaccine. That is your body's immune system um, doing what it should do to protect you. So it, it concerns me that people are afraid. We, and we've been getting vaccines for years. Vaccines are not new, but this particular vaccine was developed faster because you had a worldwide community sharing information, doing what humanity should do, work together. That's why it came together because there was a focus, a singular focus to help the world. And we, and and the vaccine is free. So, and don't forget, you might not want to take the vaccine, an individual might not, but if they get sick and become disabled, they want the government to pay and support them. They'll want Medicaid, Medicare to support them. They'll want every entitlement to help support them when they could have avoided it by a free, that kind of hardship, by a free vaccine. So how do we get the message out and encourage people that look like us to get the vaccine? Although we know there's been a lot of trauma uh, in this country as it relates to our treatment and, and medical and science. Mm-hmm. So how do, we, how do we break that cycle and change these minds? 
I believe that um, it's going to take um, each one reach one and it's and the change is going to have to happen across generations. You know, it's going to have to be family groups, you know, you getting together with your friends and family and, 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 and having circles where we really have live talk to people with with people and really point out the truth mm. in information. And, you know, the, the Center for Disease Control has really good information, but do you think people are reading it? Now they're going to Facebook, Snapchat, all kind of, you know, <laughs> Twitter, you know, when we have a real scientific um, base uh, for sharing information. So um, I think that that's one of the things we have to do is and it ha we have to be consistent. And we have to help people understand what, how to, we walk around with phones 24 seven. They have the power of um, their amazing computers, but we're not using them to get truth. Yeah. So we have to show people what truth is. We have to be consistent and vigilant, those who have knowledge, like individuals like yourself. And we have to use the power of our personal influence to yeah. help our individual circles and help people count the cost. Would you want, Dr. Holmes, would you want to put your family in jeopardy, lose your career, be a long hauler, be disabled, not have a consistent income, not be able to teach and write because you didn't take a shot that was yeah. free at your disposal? Yeah, not at all, not at all. And so, as we talk about information and, and ensuring people are getting the right knowledge, I know that you also uh, review nursing curricula. So when you're looking at these books and these texts, what are you looking for in terms of relevance um, for your students? Well, really when nursing students are learning, they, they have to learn how to apply information. You know, I'm really looking at the ability for this system and, and most uh, academic uh, publishers are using, you know, more systems, online systems, engagement, engaged learning. And so I'm looking for one to look like us, you know, have some resemble us, you know, be multicultural, but also to help uh, the students learn how to uh, think and apply. Critical thinking is across many um, types of uh, uh, education, science, you know, math, many types of areas, critical thinking is kind of, is a lacking, mm -hmm. I think, in the education of our students. Uh, p students often think that nursing is a hands-on job. Oh, I just want to, I just want to do, I want to work with my hands. But nursing is a critical thinking. You have to think right to do right, right? If you don't have the right thought, you'll kill somebody. So the critical thinking piece, the judgment, the clinical judgment is what I'm always looking for. Is the content helping develop clinical judgment, safe clinical judgment? Uh, because that is really what a nurse is getting a license to do. Yeah. They're getting a license to think. They're not before they can do. And that's powerful. I like that. Um, so tell me about you a little bit more. And I want to know who has had a tremendous impact on you in your career. Well, I'm going to, my father passed away. He was 87. But my father uh, grew up in the Deep South. Uh, he did not uh, get a chance to go to college. He was a, he was a welder. And uh, he always wanted, he believed in education. And I think that his desire to see me do well, the day I went, my first day as a freshman uh, at college was the happiest day of my father's life. I will never forget he, how happy he was to help me set up my room because it, for him, it meant I had done it. You know, he had done a good job. So I would say one, he was the greatest influence because he, under, he really believed that education could change me and offer me a chance to change the world. And he believed that education had the power to help other people that look like us. Because again, he came through Jim Crow. He came through, you know, the civil rights era. My father was, you know, he's had, we were police beat it, burst their way into my father's, our home and beat my father bloody, Miss Dr. Holmes, because um, just because he had a whole, he, they followed him home to our home one day. He had a home business, he had a truck. And they just decided to follow him and they made up some, you know, Trump 
law, you know, reason to push himself into our house. And they beat my father bloody for no reason. And left him there. Uh, my mother called the police, you know, called, the, got him help. And, you know, uh, at that time, I was in the early 60s. I was in the 60s. Wow. Uh, and so, but he believed that if he believed in education and, and that truth would prevail. He was a Christian and we were Christians. And uh, that was significant for me that that his his desire to see me go, become educated uh, and be able to have choices because he understood that the more you know, the more choices you are aware of and uh, the greater opportunity that you would have. And then as I you know, progressed in my career, I would say I had a very, I have a very dear friend, Dr. Desi Levy. Uh, she's a researcher with the uh, Medical College of Wisconsin, but we've been friends a long time. And she always pushed me, we pushed each other. Uh, and so I really have to actually you know, give her kudos for pushing <laughs> me uh, to get my doctorate as well as a good friend, Dr. Stephanie McKinney. Awesome. Well, tell me, um, so in this field of nursing, you've been in for so long, what is one thing you wish you would have known earlier? If I had known how to navigate um, the corporate, you know, learning how to navigate. So part of the career, like I said, is, is you're building anyone's career is understanding social capital. Mm -hmm. So, and understanding also the power of, um, of research, I think that I would have gone to school earlier. So I wish I had understood earlier how to navigate um, the you know, system, how to you know, navigate it better so that I could have more opportunities for myself. But I was afraid, Dr. Holmes. So early in, when I was younger, I remember when I first became a nurse working and there were some patients that wouldn't even let me take care of them because I was black. And if I was working with a white nursing assistant and they would get in the patient's room first, I would go in the room behind them and say, hello, I'm Melanie, I'm your nurse today. And they said, oh no, oh no, my nurse was here. I said, uh, no, I'm a nurse today. And if the aide would put their head in the door, they'd say like, Sally, Sally, tell her you're my nurse. And they would say, no, um, I'm the aide and she really is your nurse for the day. Having to explain that. So I think once I, you know, had, and so you prove yourself, you prove yourself. And I had proved myself for a very long time being one of the, you know, very, very good nurse, a very well respected. And I was comfortable in that. And I thought, wow, do I have the courage and the energy to push a little further and go back to school and try to achieve something else? So I wish I had known I would had that courage earlier. Um, but sometimes that's why there's power in numbers, yeah. uh, because you get more people around you and then you begin who are doing something or encouraging you and you get the faith to try it yourself. So I, I love that you share that story, um, because I want to ask you a little bit about diversity in the field. Um, how diverse is it, do you think, and can it or should it be more diverse? Oh, it's definitely needs to be more diverse. Um, and the there's two things that are happening that are going to um, make it more difficult for a diverse pool of, of uh, healthcare professionals and nurses. And one is that our, our students are not taken, are not prepared to do STEM. Students in high school that look like us, people of color, they need to, in high school, take the sciences and the math. The STEM is so important. You can't just take art and cultural studies and sociology so you can have fun in high school because it will cost you when you want to go to college. So one day, so they're not prepared. And so then because they're not prepared, they don't try to get prepared because that will cost you more money, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you don't come to college prepared to take algebra, college algebra, college science, co you know, then you're going, it's going to take you longer to get out and cost you more money. So we don't want it. So then we don't do it. So it's the preparation in high school is one thing that's going to affect us. Also then, because we have to compete. So most nursing schools, Dr. Holmes, have a limited number of students that they can enroll. So in our one of our universities, for example, they have 100 seats and 900 applicants. Wow. Um, so nursing seats are really coveted. So in order to compete, 
you have to do well in your sciences. The other thing that is going to limit the cultural diversity is just the cost of education. Because on average, uh, a university is going to cost you 20000 a year or more. There are or some more. universities in my area where it's 40000 and one university is 52000 a year. Wow. So what I recommend to students, because students ask me all the time, well, Dr. Gray, what's the best nursing school? And I tell them, Dr. Holmes, the one you can afford. Because regardless <laughs> of how much you pay for your nursing education, you're all going to take the same nursing exam, number one. Number two, new graduates start at primarily the same salary, no matter where you went to school and how much you paid for your degree. Number three, all the nursing schools go through the same accreditation process, through the same accreditors. So it's, it's pretty much apples and apples in terms of the quality because their creditors are expecting the same con certain content so that students pay, pass their boards. Because when students don't pass their boards, the school gets put, get a hand slap mm -hmm. by the state and they get a hand slap by their creditors. And so they don't want that. So they're going to follow the rules. But this is also why you have their uh, nursing schools are very selective on who they take because they really want to select students that they think are going to pass the boards. And they don't think they look like us, generally. It, wow. uh, they don't, you know, they might not say, oh, they won't, but they look at the numbers and the scores and the grades, which brings me to my other comment. Students need to understand that your high school grades follow you, can follow you a long, long time. And so when people look, when you take, you know, you apply for a job or a school and they look at your college, your high school uh, transcript and it's all jacked up with U's and F's and all this kind of stuff. They're not going to believe that, you know, you have to do some convincing now that I'm a good person. And I've changed and I can do it because your credentials, your work history called your school grades. That's your work history in high school does not look very good. So we want to have your high school transcript look as good as possible. So I mean, long story short, I, I think we will not become diverse until we, if we you know, we utilize them and compete. And we need to utilize then, I think, community colleges. With all that being said, what can really help people of color is to start at a community college where it is affordable. In my home, for example, uh, you can go to community college for like $2,000 a semester. That's good, because in two years of community college, being a, getting an associate degree as an RN, you can get your license, which gets you started. And then you can go ahead and finish, you know, matriculate further and get your bachelor's degree and other higher degrees. But we need to, to people of color, if you do not have the money, need to really utilize community colleges. I like what you said. You, you said uh, several things that I, I enjoyed listening to. Number one, we've got to do a better job in the K-12 community to make sure our students, all students, but our students in particular, are prepared to go to college. Number two, we've got to release a negative stigma around community colleges. They're accredited just like any other school. Go and get what right. you need. And you it's cost effective. Cost effective. And then you go and get that, that, that RN. In, in my era, I work for a hospital, Dr. Holmes, and if a nurse comes to them with an associate degree, our hospital pays for them to finish their bachelor's degree for free. Wow. So why wouldn't you yeah. do the community college? Because your associate degree nurse and your baccalaureate nurse start at the same wage. And there's wow. nothing on your name tag that says you uh, associate, your bachelor's, you know, wow. you're taking the same test. Now, there's, I, you know, applaud people who can get that BSN right away. But by and large, that's not people that look like us. Yeah. We have a different journey sometimes. We sometimes okay we have a different journey. And it doesn't matter what your journey is. It's that you get to the end. And nobody come up and say to you, well, you know, what was your journey? They said, do you have a license? Yeah. <laughs> so we talk to work. I think the other, um, you know, where would you like to work? And I think that we have to, 
The other co co community conversation I've had with students often is, well, they say, well, Dr. Gray, you know, I want to go to a black college and I want to have a college experience. And I am all about HBCUs at the homes. I'm all about it. But I will say I'm all about it if you can't afford it. Yeah. Because I've seen many people go for the college, you know, the experience over four years and they're paying for that over 20 because of the debt. Yeah. And and in that re regard, it, it, I, I tell people to be very careful, but I, we do have to support our HBCU. They've done a lot because the support you get from people that look like you, it's, it, mean, it, it's, it feels different than when um, it does not. So I think we need to promote our HBCUs, but that's why we need to help kids in high school get that two years of college done so they can go to the HBCUs in less time. Yeah, I agree. Or have those local high schools pay for them to go to those HBCUs. That's and right. And those HBCUs still get that money. That's right. We have to support HBCUs, but we have to look at different routes to get our kids into them because they're being underfunded. Yeah. Oh my God. All right. Listen, we got to we got we got to keep going. This is getting too good. We're going to be here for an hour and a half. So tell me this: How do you stay abreast on current research and practices? I read, 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 read. <laughs> you have to read. I mean, there's no other way about it. Um, I try to read a couple articles a week and I create an article file I have um, on different things so that, you know, when an opportunity comes up, I want to maybe write on it. I want to present on it. I want to see how I can apply it to my practice. How can I help fellow nurses apply things to their practices by reading? You know, Knowledge, learning is a lifelong activity. And information is changing at such a rapid rate, you have to read continually. So tell me this, what has been your biggest accomplishment to date? Well, I would say the number of students that I've been able to mentor and help. You know, I don't think uh, an award or a degree means anything if, or, you know, accolades mean nothing if you haven't helped someone along the way. Um, achievement to me is a, a life well spent is a life given out in service to others. And, um, and so I would say that is my greatest accomplishment is that I have mentored a lot of people um, and I've been able to love and support a lot of people toward their dreams. And mm -hmm. that is the greatest thing for me. Well, this is been wonderful for me. Um, I have enjoyed talking to you and I'm sure the viewers and listeners are getting a lot from the conversation that um, we're having. Um, before we go, I want you to talk a little bit about how your affiliation with the Black Doctoral Network has enhanced your career. Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm here. <laughs> I am here uh, this morning and, uh, you know, I have now social media and I have a network of people that look like me that are pursuing research and trying to help other people do the same. Yeah. Uh, because this is what, you know, I think has enhanced, as if we're talking about people of color, African-Americans in America, this is what brought us up. It was the, it was the young people at the, in, the, in, the, um, in HBCUs that led civil rights. They were all at HBCUs. That's how we have the freedom that for their, their effort is what brought us here today. And so seeing the, uh, being part of the Black Doctoral Network says to me that we have not forgotten our roots as a people. And so I applaud this network for bringing to the forefront the need to work together, to be together, and to use our uh, education to elevate society, to elevate our people. And so I'm really excited about that. Awesome, awesome. But thank you so much for joining me today, Dr. Gray. Uh, if you would not mind, please tell our viewers and listeners where they can go and learn more about you and the work that you're doing. Oh, yes. My website is askdrmelaniegray.com. There you go. You have it. Very simple, y'all. Askdrmelaniegray.com. Well, please be sure to stay connected to the Black Doctoral Network and connect with us on all of our social media channels. Thank you for joining us today for the Black Doctor Talk podcast. We hope you will join us again next time. But for now, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and always tell a friend. Thank you, Dr. Gregg, for being here as my special guest. And I have totally enjoyed my time with you today.
Thank you, Dr. Holmes. It's been a pleasure being with you as well. Make it awesome. a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys. Bye-bye.